Thank you, Pugal. Thank you for uh, moderating. I'd like to uh, thank the Honorable Minister and the Honorable MP Sashitar and uh, Professor Christo Jeffrele for uh, coming here and spending uh, your time. In fact, uh, Christoph, I just finished reading your book today morning and it was, a, it was very well written and very well researched. So before going further, I, I uh, do spot the Honorable MP of uh, the DMK, uh, uh, TK Thilungoman, in the attendees list. So I'd like to thank him for participating as well as the readers editor of uh, the Hindu uh, AS Panitsal. I thank both of them for being active in DPF and coming um, uh, always and helping us in all possible manners. So uh, before uh, uh, proceeding with the q and I would like to um, request the attendees that if you have a question, please raise your hands or just post your questions and then we would invite you and then you could ask your questions on the screen. So uh, before going further, uh, the Honorable MP, Mr. TK Hilgo would like to make an observation and he has a question. Um, could he be brought onto the screen, please? I mean, thank you, Mr. Dharnidharan, Mr. Cooper. I was listening to the speeches made by Professor Jafula and uh, Sashitadu, Dr. Sashitadu Taru. The politics which I have seen during the last, say, about 50, 60 years is that Hindu, there, this BJP and RSS was always a Hinduistic party. Hindutva, they even challenged the, the court of law during some, an election. And they said that Hinduism is different from Hindutva and all. You know the case in the Bombay High Court, an election petition in the Bombay High Court. What I feel is, could you listen? Could you hear? Oh, yes, sir, we can hear you. It's, it's very clear. Please go ahead. I feel is, people of India, they are all Hindus, but they are not for a religious government. That is what I have seen because they have continuously elected Congress. They did not choose BJP. But when they chose BJP, it was not because of the religious, they want to have a religious identity, but because of the failure of the party in power. That was what I say. I see. Because in 1977, the Congress lost elections only because it brought emergency. Otherwise, earlier it was a very good government. So because of emergency, the Congress lost elections. In 1996, some of the economic reforms made people think otherwise. Likewise, when Modi came to power, he did not talk about Hindutva. Not, nowhere in his election propaganda that he was speaking about Hindutva. He was speaking about economic development. So there is a clash within the party. What I have, I, I observe is two, Modi is operated by two sets of people. One, the RSS, which is a core Hindutva party, which has no popular support. The other is the, some rich people of the country who want to take away the public undertakings of their own, for their own. So Modi is being operated by two sets of people. His, in, in, none of, in both the elections, I can say in both the 2014 or 2019 election, he did not speak, the BJP did not speak about Religion. Even now, they just claim, see, what is secularism? What they say is, secularism was, was introduced by Indira Gandhi by an amendment to the constitution. It was not in the original constitution. But Article 25 was in the original constitution. Article 25, if explained, it is a secular constitution. It is a secular country. It speaks of secularism. So the word in the preamble, it's not important, but there is a provision in the constitution that India is a secular country. And we can see people electing other governments like in Tamil Nadu, like in Kerala. See, in Kerala, people wanted a good state government. They thought that CPIM will do good to them. But when it came to parliament, they thought that Congress will fight against BJP. That is the idea they elected Congress. So, people are not for this religious majoritarianism. 
that is what they have proved time and again and the bjp also did not talk about religious majoritarianism they only talked about economic reforms and welfare they in fact in the first election modi said about gujarat model economic development now he talked about many other things so what i see is if the opposition who are who have secular uh, policies unite together people will support them. majoritarian ism in, in terms of religion is not acceptable to the indian people i have that was what many elections have shown people are not they, they want they are indians they don't want to be called as hindus they are indians even in karnataka one set of uh, people who are in bjp also they said that we are not hindus that is how the people are they have a different mindset they want development they want peace they want good employment they expect a democratic government to provide them socio economic protection that is what they want if the government could provide that they will vote that government they have been voting that government since 1952 i have seen so they have changed government only when they feel that the government had let them down not on religious grounds only on economic grounds that is my observation of india's politics i think uh, professor jeffla or uh, dr sashi tharoor may have different idea but if they can explain me i will also accept i sincerely feel that people of this country wants a peaceful social life good economic life good uh, economic life that is what they want they will elect a government which can do that which can promise that and sometimes the majoritarianism beyond majoritarianism i have seen that regionalism had played a better role because they have elected regional parties the state governments only because the regional parties cannot have a you cannot rule the center that they had to rely on congress or a national party but in majority of the states regional parties were chosen by the people because they work for their region they did not, they do not preach religion none of the regional parties preach religion they work for the people of that region so people want a socially and economically secured life and they feel that these people who work for us who are with us who can understand us can provide that this kind of uh, regionalism and nationalism there is a clash they they see that if there is any failure in development they throw that domain out they don't want that term and whichever party promises development they chose so virtually the bjp had cheated the people by making certain promises about economic development and after coming to power the government is working for somebody else and the workers are doing something else they are working for the religion and the government is working for the rich so even in recent days i have seen that the india has uh, some leaders who are uh, uh, rich people and india stands fifth in the list of rich people of the world so that is my view if somebody can help me or clarify me i will be thankful thank you uh, sir uh, thank you so much um next to go would be uh, brian wong so uh, can you bring brian wong in please hi hello oh, hello am i audible Oh yes you are yeah lovely okay i'm going to try switch on my camera as well i'm not entirely sure what's going on but uh okay if not i'll just proceed with a question um hi so thank you all very much for that incredibly intense and also rich and robust discussion i'd just like to take this opportunity to ask a question concerning uh, what dr thoreau you said about the dangers of ethnic nationalism and ethnocentric nationalism and the prospects of a civic nation as the alternative i couldn't but find myself you know agreeing and nodding along in agreement with a lot of the points you raised but i do want to raise a question concerning feasibility 
that the rise of ethno-nationalist, Hinduist, so rhetoric uh, in an extremist form emanating from certain segments of the BJP over the, the past decade seems to suggest that there are certain segments in the Indian population that feel disillusioned, disenamored with the civic nationalism that had been previously touted and advocated, whether it be because they see it as disconnected with the lived experiences of the poor, or that it is not as visceral or as effective in uniting the crowd in face of economic downturn and adversities and crises, or indeed just the simple fact that ethnic divisions had always been latent in a country and had now recently only come to manifest, of course, but with very little redress or response and adjustment to uh, these cleavages and divisions. But all in all, it strikes me that ethno-nationalist rhetoric does have uh, this traction, you know, like it or not. And I'm not defending or being an apologist for it, but I must therefore ask the question, would the panelists think that in order for civic nationalism or more cosmopolitan moral outlook to take over, or at the very least to reconcile itself with a larger proportion of the population in India, some elements of ethnocentrism might as a opposed to completely you know, dismantling or seeking to repress the latent ethnocentric tendencies in large swathes of the population. Uh, and that's the question I wanted to ask. So thank you all very much for your time. Thanks. Dhani, would you want us to answer now? You're collecting a bunch of questions. So you can go ahead, please. You can go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I, first of all, thank you, Brian, for that, uh, that thoughtful question. Um, obviously, you're right that within every society, there are ethnic groups and ethnic tendencies that can be exacerbated by politicians if they want. It's true in the Britain in which you live, uh, the Britain of Brexit and post-Brexit. It's also very true in every other democracy that there are elements that, uh, that push a, a strongly ethnic identity-based politics. Uh, but uh, part of the challenge in, in such societies is by affirming a constitution that goes beyond ethnicity, these countries ensure that people play by rules that do not privilege ethnicity. So the rules and laws and institutions are the guarantor of the kind of civic nationalism we're talking about. So people may have ethnic leanings, and I don't think, as I said, that it's necessarily, um, uh, shall we say, I mean, it, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a negative in that it exists everywhere, it's simply a reality of life and of societies. But to keep them in their place and not to allow themselves to manifest themselves in ways that define political identity, uh, that's part of the challenge of democratic politics and of constitutionalism. Liberal constitutionalism is ultimately what guarantees uh, how, how a democracy works. And in our case, the constitution is very clear. It, it makes no difference. So my base, my optimism, on the fact that for 70 years, we've actually lived like that. Yes, there have been ethnically, religiously, linguistically based interest groups, which have organized themselves and have played, but they've played in the same playing field as everyone else. And ultimately they've worked together. And so if you were to look, for example, at the, the, um, the question of, uh, of um, the way in which Indians live for the most part, uh, most of the time uh, people, get along with each other, work together, play games together, and so on, irrespective of these divisions. Um, and sometimes they are deliberately sought to be exacerbated and manipulated uh, in a conscious act of, of polarization for political purposes. And to my mind, that latter one is reprehensible. Uh, going back to, to, to the first question of Mr. Ellen Goban asked, I'll just say that he's absolutely correct that um, Congress didn't lose in 2014 to people who wanted uh, Hindutva leadership. Uh, they certainly voted for um, the kinds of messaging Mr. Modi gave in the 2014 election, which were all about anti-corruption, development, um, uh, inclusive growth, the Gujarat model. That was the kind of propaganda that people voted for. But it's the 2019 result that gives us pause because Mr. Modi did not in fact govern on the basis of what he had campaigned in 2014. He governed on an increasingly exclusionary and, and Hindutva agenda. And 2019 still saw him come back to power uh, with an increased majority. And he has taken that, he and his party have taken that as a license to be far more, um, shall we say majoritarian, far more um, uh, uh, directive in, in imposing their view 
of Hindutva in a series of laws, political actions, abolition of Article 370, Jammu and Kashmir, where you shut down the internet and locked up political leaders, uh, the criminalization of triple talaq, which is already illegal after Supreme Court judgment, but one community's divorce and abandonment is criminalized, whereas others uh, are not touched and so on and so forth. You're seeing one issue after another in which the majoritarian agenda is now openly being advocated. And I must say, I was going to say this in my speech, but I thought it's worth mentioning now in the context of these questions and answers, that we have a very, very major looming crisis that the Dravidian Professionals Forum must be aware of. And that is that in 2026, the constitutional amendment that freezes the apportionment of Lok Sabha seats in parliament on the numbers of the 1971 census will lapse. And at that point, there is no doubt that if, if the present Hindutva Brigade, the Muditva Brigade are in power, they will move immediately at that point to um, reapportioning the seats, which will give a dramatic increase to the number of seats in the Hindi heartland states and will reduce the number of seats, or at least the percentage of seats, because the total number may increase. So our seats may not reduce, but as a percentage of parliament, we will no longer constitute an effective block in parliament, uh, uh, the southern states. And you may end up in a situation where uh, the constitution can be freely amended because two thirds of the votes will belong to a very like-minded group of, of, of Hindi speaking northern states. So this is a, a very serious threat. It's not that far away, 2026. Uh, and, and in fact, some people are saying the BJP could even move sooner if they sense that uh, they will not win the present uh, with the present configuration, they will not win the 2024 elections. They can very quickly move to amend the constitution sooner. They have the votes to do so. And, and to, um, to uh, uh, bring in a reapportionment of parliament in time for the 2024 elections. So you have to really be concerned that majoritarian nationalism uh, that we're talking about is not merely a theoretical concept or a conceptual debate, which uh, is, is partly the way that many of us perhaps have, have tried to see it, it also will have a very direct practical implication on all our lives if this kind of uh, thinking were to also be accompanied by an alteration of the political balance protected by the constitution of today. Very serious issue. Yeah. If I may add, um, I fully agree with what Sashi has just said, but um, I'd like to return to the question where people disillusioned with civic nationalism. I don't think that is the reason why BGP took over power, really. I don't think that is the reason. But I would add two factors to, to the one uh, Shashi has listed. One that is completely uh, under the radar is the groundwork of RSS for 100 years. Now, there is no other example in the world of an organization making progress in each and every sector of society for 100 years. And it's not only, of course, in cities with middle-class people, it's also through the Seva Bharti, through the Vidya Bharti uh, organizations uh, everywhere in the countryside. Never forget this. Because this is one of the reasons why you can also think that there is something like a deep state in India, a kind of equivalent to what we usually consider as the deep state on the other side. That's a very important factor that is always underestimated, systematically underestimated. And the thing and factor that can explain 2014 is the way the Pakistani slash Islamist GID threat has been instrumentalized. As early as 2002, just before the post Godra program, Pakistan is seen as having planned this attack of the Sabar, on the Sabarmati Express. And for 20 years, you have in each and every election, Pakistan considered as a threat that has to be resisted. And of course, Pulwama is a culminating point in this, in this moment. Well, one of your um, members asked a question about emotions. Well, emotions play a huge role in populist propaganda. Politics of fear, fear and anger. 
you are fearful and you are angry to be fearful. How can you be so vulnerable? How can you feel so vulnerable? And you have a choky there protecting you. Here we are. That's a major dimension of the populist, national populist, uh, I would say propaganda and success. And the last factor that can be also mentioned, well, national populism a la BJP is primarily a reaction to reservations to the rise of OBCs and Dalits in North Indian politics. Look at the chronology. There is absolutely no doubt that it started with Gujarat, post uh, Madhav Singh Solanki's uh, reforms in the 80s, the Patels shift to BJP, Gujarat becomes a BJP state for 25 years. The same model is replicated post Mandal, Mandal II also, never forget Mandal II, 2006, Arjun Singh, reservations in the university system. Mandal I, Mandal II make the elite or the upper caste elite of the Indi belt fearful of losing their hegemony. And they regroup, and not only the Savarnas, but Jats, uh, of course, um, Marathas behind uh, BGP Shiv Sena. So it's not, it's not about nationalism. I mean, it's not about uh, a rejection of Congress who would have done something wrong. It's much more about the policy Congress had followed. It's a reaction to what UPA had done. RTI, RTE, right to food, reservations, all this had to be countered. And national populism was, of course, uh, the best instrument for this. And the politics of fear uh, came at, a, at the right time. So we see there things we see elsewhere. Trump was a reaction to Obama and his uh, Obamacare social services, the blacks and the Hispanics coming up. Uh, Bolsonaro is a reaction to Lula, uh, pro poor policies. National populism is a reaction to progressive politics. Never forget this subtext. It's not identity only, it's social interest. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, now we have uh, the readers editor of, of uh, The Hindu um, with this question. So I invite uh, Mr. A.S. Pani Silvan, please. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can hear you, sir. Uh, see, my question is much more uh, slightly on a conceptual framework. Um, political scientist Alfred Stefan used to say that India is the only country where two forms of nation building came together. One is coming together, another one is holding together. If the growth of Hindu nationalism is going to be a reality, what are its corrosive power on the idea of coming together? And how does it help holding together gain more power? Because we know that holding together has very little democratic component to it. It's essentially the nation state has a huge power that keeps these populace together. Whereas coming together as an aspiration, shared interest, all those things have been embedded in it. So my question is, the idea of current wave of Hindu nationalism, how much does it corrode the idea of coming together? I mean, the answer uh, to some degree is embedded in your question, Mr. Paneer Salvan, which is that uh, ultimately anything that says that you have to be one thing to be acceptable to the Hindu nationalists uh, immediately excludes those who don't identify themselves by that one thing, whether it's Hindu, whether it's Hindi speaking. I had mentioned the Pew Research Survey and it was startling to discover what a large percentage of North Indian Hindus consider that you have to speak Hindi to be Indian, that you have to be a Hindu to be Indian. So, I mean, these ideas are by definition exclusionary. And when you are excluding them, inevitably you're making it impossible for people to come together. Having said that, let me also congratulate you on your uh, 
column at, as, as a reader's editor. I know it's coming to an end now, but I've been enjoying it over the years, and I must say it's a splendid innovation by you and your newspaper. Thank, Thank you. you. If I may add one point, because um, I think we have not mentioned this so far, federalism, the federal structure of power in India is one of the way for the country to all together. And we will all remember the way Nehru reluctantly, but finally decisively agreed to withdraw the map of India according to the linguistic criterion in a pragmatic, constructive manner. Well, we are seeing today an attack on federalism that is unprecedented since Indira Gandhi. Now, Indira Gandhi uh, in the 60s and 70s even more uh, had only yes men as chief ministers uh, and mm, revived centrifugal forces in Kashmir, in Assam, in, in Punjab. Well, we are somewhat following the same course with very little decision, important decisions made in consultation with the chief ministers. Now, how could you do the demonetization without consulting the chief ministers? How can you do the lockdown, the first lockdown, without consulting the first, the, the, the chief ministers? So this idea that to all together, you need, of course, a society that is open, that is congenial, but you also need institutions. And federalism is a key element of the capacity of India to hold together and to live together. If you undermine federalism to such an extent, you, re you repeat the mistakes of the past and you reignite centrifugal forces. And centrifugal forces are always supported by outsiders because they lay themselves to external supporters. So it's playing with fire. And um, of course, it's also completely counterproductive because if you do not bring all the chief ministers around issues like the GST, around issues like so many things need to be done together. Otherwise, you waste time and you waste energy and, you, and it's counterproductive. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister. And so is it, uh, Dr. Tharoor, is it okay? We go for one more question now? Yeah, 8.30, okay. I believe. Okay, fine. So we have uh, a question from uh, Sanurag Basu. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Basu, can you just keep your question as short as possible? Because- Oh, uh, yeah, 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 thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you for today's discussion. And as for the question, do you feel that other parties copying BJP's IT so and infamous elections strategies is the key to combating more than the BJP wave, or is it a pathway from one form of pure democracy to another? <laughs> All right, let me respond to that before I leave you. I mean, I, I must say that uh, that there has been a certain level of, uh, of imitation on the social media front because. Uh, Let's face it, though I am an early adopter of Twitter, my party was traditionally fairly resistant to all of this, and the BJP put us all to shame by um, getting onto uh, social media in a very big way to compensate for, at that time, uh, the, the uh, liberal bias of the, of the national media. And they gave themselves um, an extraordinary advantage by dominating a space that the other major national party had essentially not chosen to occupy. So social media became a major calling card. And of course, the invention of WhatsApp clinched it because the BJP was able to create these multiple WhatsApp groups. So not only did they pay people to run IT cells and send messages on, on Twitter and Facebook, but they also had people who ran. So each individual runs say 50 WhatsApp groups. Each group had 256 people. Each one was targeted to a particular interest in a particular language, and they bombarded these people daily, multiple times a day with uh, propaganda. And it actually worked extremely well. It worked so well that uh, at the end of the day, our, uh, our uh, politics has become unrecognizable from what it used to be. And a lot of people's perceptions of, of India's history, culture, individual national leaders and so on, have been shaped by the half-baked propaganda uh, on these, on these uh, social media outlets, which is why it's impossible for other parties to ignore. And that's why, for example, 
uh, you take someone like Rahul Gandhi was not even on social media till a few years ago. Now he's a significant presence and is accused of using it principally uh, as, his, as, his, uh, as his tool for messaging. But he has learned that if you don't do this, you don't reach today's uh, agenda setting public. Um, but I would say that India is a peculiar place where our politics still involves multiple layers of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of political activity. That is that you have social media, but you also have people going door to door. You also have mass rallies in the tens of thousands, which are pretty much extinct in the West. You also have, um, uh, you know, jeeps going around blaring music and, and with megaphones and so on, retailing messages. You, you have multiple ways of getting your message across to the public. And so if the question implies that we are simply in the process of imitating the BJP's uh, techniques, all I can say is that now pretty much every party finds it has to be on the same page with a mixture of political techniques that now can no longer exclude social media. Uh, the BJP has the lead because they also have the resources. I think Christoph pointed out that the BJP has spent uh, more than the rest of the opposition parties combined in the last election. That is that they spent literally, uh, I think you said Christoph, 55% of yeah. all the money recorded to have been spent. And of course, uh, there's a lot of money that's off the books as well, as you all know in Tamil Nadu, where it's a popular pastime to bribe voters. All I can say is that, is that the BJP has, has uh, uh, got a level of funding buttressed by the new electoral bonds that makes it impossible for the others to compete. So what we're doing is to do as much as we can in the comparable space. And today I would argue that in the social media space, um, in, in many ways, um, the BJP is getting as much as it has given. Uh, that is, it's being attacked as much as it has administered attacks in the past. But uh, is that the way in the future for Indian politics? Who knows? It's all been evolving very busy. I remember as recently as the 29, uh, 2009 elections, I was literally the only candidate. I'm sorry, apart from LK Adwani, the only candidate with a website of his own. By 2014, maybe 10 or 20% of the candidates was using social media uh, as well as to reach the uh, electorate. By 2019, a majority were doing so. And Mr. Modi has actually instructed his cabinet that every minister in the cabinet has to have a social media account and, and should be tweeting regularly. And now, of course, they're going on the Indian rival to Twitter coup and doing that as well. So there's a, there's a whole lot of change and evolution just happened in, in the last decade, which is bound to again continue to evolve in the years ahead. So we'll see how we go. But um, if your question implies, is the BJP in the lead and the rest of us are following the same track? Yes, we are. I'd like to react to what uh, uh, Honorable Minister uh, said just before, when, when he mentioned uh, two things that I really want to comment upon. The, the irrationality of BGP voters is indeed uh, puzzling. And for understanding this, we need to factor in notions like charisma and uh, notions like uh, religiosity. And, uh, and that's why probably uh, the sustainability of, of BGP in the North and in the West is, uh, is taking place. No. The charismatic leader cannot be wrong. Uh, he doesn't fail his people, his people fail him. And uh, it was true of Indira Gandhi the same way. You know, she could win again in 1980, only two years after emergency, after forced sterilization of 11 million people, because she was above accountability. And, and Modi has reached this level, he is above accountability. And it's very sad for the country because a non-accountable leader doesn't care so much for the economy. He doesn't fight his battle on the economic ground. He fights his battle on the symbolic ground. So there'll be a huge campaign for the building of the Ayodhya temple in 2024 and the next elections will be fought on such an issue. Also because the, the results on, of the economy will be so bad that uh, there will be no way he, he can use them. But 
this is probably why RSS is still on board because this is their view of the world uh, that is represented there. And the other point you, you raised, which is of course, uh, when we look to the future, uh, what, what can be done when in the, in the countries where a national populist leader has been checkmate, usually all the opposition parties have joined hands. They have taken a long time to do it. You know, look at Israel. It took three elections in two years. But at the end, Netanyahu was eased out because every party from all kinds of backgrounds, people who could never form a coalition before, finally realized that it was a survival question. If you want to survive, you have to join hands. And that's probably a lesson to, well, to keep in mind uh, for, the, uh, for the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christoph. So I want to ask, do you have uh, some more time for one or two questions or you want to- Yeah, one or two questions, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and also thank you for talking about uh, Karishma. I read a lot about Karishma in your book and also your reference to uh, Max Weber and so on and so forth. I think Max Weber is one of the best authors when it comes to uh, Karishma and institutional building. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I, I actually read this book for a course at the Anspo uh, <laughs> from Grossman. So next to go would be um, uh, Shankar, Jay Shankar. Can you please let him in? Jay Shankar? Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah, my question would be to Christopher. When you spoke about majoritarian democracy, and Dr. Peter also spoke about cultist uh, culture, this is not only uh, to India. World over, you could see this. When uh, in USA there was a Trump, in Philippines, in Israel, in India, everywhere there is a dictatorship coming in the form of. Uh, religious nationalism or majoritarian democracy. In such a case, how do you think political parties can and should reinvent themselves so that the public discourse is not being completely hijacked by religious nationalism? Yeah. Does such a movement will involve cross-border discussion, just like what DPF is right now doing it. And in such case, if there are some cross-border discussions, political discussions going on, how do you think we should handle the accusation of external influence? Especially, like you said, we are facing an emotional quotient versus a rational quotient. Yeah. Well, the, the only route that has worked so far is twofold. On the one hand, unity of the opposition. That's key. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you refocus the public debate on socioeconomic issues. You know, you re-establish the social welfare programs, the reservations program, uh, something like the NREGA as center stage. In order to counter what the populists are doing. The, the populists are not for the people. They are for the elites fearing the uh, plebeians who are on the rise. So when they reach power, they, usually, they, they do not redistribute. They don't spend on the poor. What they do for the poor is Swaj Bharat or uh, Janda Yojna or uh, Ujwal Yojna, but it's one shot, you know? Nothing compared to an RGA, for instance. So to, re, uh, to return to, to redistribution techniques, a kind of social democratic uh, platform is the only way to shift the debate. And uh, hopefully this is what will happen at the end of this cycle, you know? The, there is a, a kind of nationalistic emotional cycle that will go get out of stream uh, almost mechanically 
but there, there need to be an alternative, an alternative that is uh, based on socioeconomic issues. That, that's, that's what I really consider as the explanation for the success of, of opponents uh, in, in this kind of uh, context uh, when, when they have succeeded, plus unity that is absolutely crucial. You know? And the problem so far as the unity concept is concerned is that so many politicians are for sale that you may uh, win elections, but the day after BGP is in a position to retain power because of defections. And defections in Madhya Pradesh, defections in Karnataka uh, have shown that it's not because parties join ends that power moves uh, and, and, and shifts from some ends to other ends. That's, that's a big caveat on the India, in the Indian case. Uh, thank you. Um, next would be Mr. Yeah, there's Mr. Venkatesh. Can you please, uh, please let Venkatesh in? Uh, Venkatesh, you can please go ahead with your questions. If, if the question is not coming, there is one question in the in the chat that I'd like to pick up, and that is the yeah, caste. Sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No, there is a very good question on caste politics. You know, how does Indudva uh, somewhat neutralizes or not caste politics? Well, it doesn't, and 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 it's very important to to uh, see that um, in spite of the ideology that is propagated that we are above caste, we don't do caste politics. Uh, BGP does. And uh, it, it does in, in a very sophisticated manner that is usually not really understood. In most of the states where reservations have worked, some dominant Dalit caste, Dalit Jatis, and some dominant OBC Jatis have cornered reservations. You know, you take the example of Uttar Pradesh. Yadavs on the one end, Jatavs on the other end have cornered reservations. Infuriating non-dominant Yadavs and non-dominant SCs. Small caste groups which have not very much benefited from reservations. These are the groups that BJP has co-opted. Bungies, Lodis, you know, the list is very long. Small caste groups, but when you add up all these caste groups, they are much more important demographically than either the Jatavs or the Yadavs. And this is a very important explanation for the success of BJP in the Indie Belt. The caste politics that it has implemented that is built paradoxically on the success of reservations for some caste groups which have become um, somewhat dominant and who have, which have alienated uh, the others. And that's why when you look at the CSDS surveys, you see so many poor voting for the BJP. Now the poor vote for the BJP as much as the rich today. Why? Because they have tapped this group of poor OBCs, poor SCs, who have not benefited from reservations as much as the others. So this is a very important question that uh, has been raised in the chat, uh, in Dudva politics as a subtext, that is caste politics. One, it's a reaction to reservations. Two, it's a way to get those who have not benefited from reservations. So you have the upper caste and the poorer of the lower castes.